2015, Pantanene got fired and I had done this presentation, but at least I had done the presentation. We were out drinking and the news came. I didn't have to change anything. This time I wake up this morning, quarter to five, because I get up early for my show and uh, I look at it and it's like, oh. But uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But more perhaps, so it's a 1,001 days since I've done a live power hour. 1,001 days ago happened to be the 5th of March, 2020, and Paul and I were in Durban for a power hour. I'd phoned him on the Monday and said, dude, there's this thing. We've got to change the topic. We've got to talk about pandemics. And then I'm in Durban, and the first case happened. Um, a little dot on the chart there was that one occurred being skiing. Uh, and that is literally 1,001 days. It has been an incredibly wild ride. It's great to have uh, audiences again, because I've been presenting the whole pandemic. But of course, I've been doing it from my tiny little flat in Bromfontein. It's nice to actually get out and come to, is it nice to come to Santon? I don't know. It's Santon. It's out. It's people. You know what it's like to see people. That's maybe what, what, what questions. So this evening is about what's happened in the last year and what's going to happen the next year. Every year I ask folks on Twitter what they think is going to happen to the market. Um, and I've got to say, Twitter has 100% success rate so far. We asked them what they thought the top 40 would do in 2022. Whoops. And majority said green. And it was green. We and the dates I'm looking at, I'm going back a year. I'm not doing calendar year. I'm going back to this event last year, which happened to be on the 2nd of December. So it's kind of a day short, but and in fact, they were from last night because etc. Um, and then today I asked folks what they thought. And again, they said it will be green. Very important. This I did yesterday. And that matters a whole lot because, well, things are happening all of a sudden. So the crowd is bullish. The crowd is saying things are going to be great. We're going to be green. Although green is relative, we're not massively green this year. But first, as we always do, we go back and look at what I said a year ago and look at the stocks I suggested a year ago and see how I did a year back. Um, I said the top 40 would be green. We indeed are. I said the czar would be weaker. We indeed were weaker. And then today we just took a snot club. And yesterday we traded 1680. Today we traded 1780. Um, the czar has been weaker over the last year. I said the US would be red. And that was just in valuations because at the end of last year, US valuations were frankly insane. Um, and I thought they would come back down to earth uh, and back down to earth that time. Totally did. I said our GDP would be back above December 19 levels, in other words, pre pandemic, and we got there by literally a couple of <laughs> tens of millions of czar, but we will take it. I said supply chains would improve. I hate that thing already. Um, and they did improve but not quite as I expected. I didn't expect that, truthfully, supply chains have sort of improved in the last month or three. I really thought they would be better from like, I don't know, January or February, but they are getting back. And if you spoke, I chatted with Stephen Joffe from uh, Invicta on Monday, and he was saying just in the last few weeks, they've suddenly seen uh, stock just becoming available just en masse, uh, and they are stocking up like crazy because they don't know when things will change. China will talk about that. I said resources would weaken. They did, but first they went up, and year to date, they're actually mostly green. We'll have a look at more details and resources in a moment. I said the place to be was financials. And as of close yesterday, the place to be was financials. Uh, and we'll look at that chart as well. It's been a good year for, for the Finney 15, which is mostly banks. There's some insurers in there and a couple of REITs at the same time. But certainly that had a great year. Um, and I said inflation would be back with a vengeance. It truthfully was back with a lot more vengeance than I thought. We've got developed market inflation at 40-year highs, uh, back to the 1980s. If you, I vaguely remember that. I was not very young in the early 80s, but I, not very old. I remember in the 70s, petrol rationing. They cut speed limits. You could only buy petrol like eight to five. Was it Monday to Friday? And, and I, I forget exactly. I was a kid, but I remember the complexities of, do you rush to the petrol station and get there before closing? Or do you risk it that you can drive around? all those fun and games. Rate increases everywhere. Uh, most of the central banks the world over are behind the curve. Yes, we're looking at Jerome Powell. Yes, we're looking at the BOE uh, and the uh, European Central Bank. Uh, we had already started raising rates by this time last year. We had our first rate increase in November, but certainly rates could. I said pandemic would be largely over and that the vaccine totally do work. I've had three vaccines. I got, well, I have got 5G, but I had to get it on my telephone because it didn't come with the vaccine, which was a rather massive disappointment. Um, and I said we would be back at person in the JSC in December 2022, and that was close. That was close. Um, more than a few people during the course of the year said, are we going to be back at the JSC anytime soon? And I'm like, yeah, look at that, look at that. So 
it's actually a little wild. I actually had a spectacular year in terms of what I thought would happen. And then I tell you a whole bunch of stocks to buy. And well, there was some, shall we say, misses. Uh, I held Marion Roberts this time last year. I no longer hold Marion Roberts because I don't like things that are, I mean, do we call them bankrupt? Maybe not. Um, also purple. Truthfully, if you had bought those stocks in equal weight, you underperformed the top 40, which is a little bit awkward. Yeah, I know. It happens sometimes. So, and, and that's part of the disconnect, right? I get all of that right, and then I get the actual part that matters wrong. And that's because those predictions are easy to make in many senses. There's two tricks to it. One is assume trends continue, because they typically do. And the second is probability. Bayesian theory, you can largely run it, and you can be fairly accurate. And that's the big picture. It's the small picture that then gets the really, really complex part. But... There are some burning questions. Let's run through those, and then we'll look forward to 2023. Uh, first burning question is, hello, ESCOM. I mean, the, the ESCOM story is quite simple, right? They just don't work. I don't know what those dots are. They're not on my screen. I think it's just, maybe they're on. Um, ESCOM doesn't work, and ESCOM is not solvable. ESCOM is not savable. Uh, they've got 400 billion of debt. Apparently, we're gonna take over half of it as uh, taxpayers. You know what, it doesn't matter. We pay for it anyway, but that doesn't solve ESCOM either. ESCOM is just broken. That's the bad news. <clears throat> the good news is back in August, our president, uh, basically deregulated de our, our energy industry to the point that we now have, and there's still some T's and C's and legislation to come, and of course there's issues with that because of our president, um, but that will then give us one of the most liberal energy markets in the world, which is frankly quite astounding considering that just a year ago, Greta Mantasha was like, no, one megawatt self-generation capacity is all you need. We could go and build a Madupi ourselves privately on land and it is perfectly legal and we can wheel it into the grid and everything else. And that is what is going to save us. There are currently nine gigawatts pipeline by private industry uh, in pipeline. And there's challenges with it. Some of the challenges are simply supply, getting the stuff, because everyone wants wind turbines and solar panels, et cetera. But importantly, every stage of load shedding is a gigawatt. And this nine gig, I mean, Vietnam put nine gigs onto their grid in two years when they deregulated. We can absolutely do it. The problem with it, it's renewable, and there's battery issues. We understand the sun don't shine at night and the wind doesn't always blow. Batteries remain the challenge for renewable, but it does mean that you know, the JC won't suddenly lose power because they will have renewable from somewhere. Maybe they don't create it themselves. Maybe somebody else does, some business does, they sell it to them, whatever the case may be. So we're going to go off ESCOM and we need to because notwithstanding, ESCOM is currently delivering 50% of its fleet capacity on a good day. 50% of its fleet needs to be retired in the next decade or two because it's old, it's broken, and we know that because the power keeps on going off. ESCOM is over, it is game, it, it's just done. I mean, you just, you, the point is, it, how do you effectively just pull the plug on it? I suppose we wait for everyone else. We will deregulate, we will build as private industry, and load shedding will be gone. We will probably... We're going to have a lot more load shedding, but within a year, we will start seeing the pressure coming off the load shedding. Less stages, lower stages. Already, folks in Cape Town uh, are typically a stage below the rest of the country because they've got some of their own private generation that they can pump into the system. We've got Kelvin Power Station. I mean, we could plug that. There's loads that we can do about it. The thing is, ESCOM's a disaster. That's fine. Truthfully, we don't need ESCOM. If you can, put solar panels and batteries on your house. A, it gives you power, and B, it gives you cheaper pricing. And uh, C, it makes the value of your house go upwards. Um, yeah, okay. So you know what, truthfully, yeah, none of that matters anymore. Um, <laughs> no, well, except the last line. The market is not the economy. And I'm going to come back to that. So this morning I wake up and I haul out my phone. My lovely wife makes me a coffee. I go have a cigarette and a coffee and I look at what's happened. Um, and it's the president has been recommended for impeachment. Fortunately, I go to bed early, so I didn't see it last night because then I wouldn't have slept. I would have spent last night redoing it. There is a bunch that is happening here. Short answer, how is this going to play out? Don't know, because 24 hours ago, that wasn't even an optionality. Here's how I think it's going to play out. There are two rumors swirling out there. One is that we're going to get a family meeting, the last one from Ramaphosa, and two is that he will quit. Now, here's the thing. Say what you will about Ramaphosa. There are two things that are distinctly true about him. He is an honorable man, and he's an incredibly private man. 
Does he want to go through all of this chaos of impeachment? Why doesn't he just go and spend time with his billions and his cows in Limpopo? I would. Hell, I would have done that a long time ago. So here's how I think it's going to play. There was an NEC meeting scheduled for this evening. It's now apparently been moved to tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock. I think he's going to resign as leader of the ANC. Not the government, leader of the ANC. He will step aside for the elective conference, which starts on the 16th of December. He will not stand at the elective conference. That leaves one person on the, on the ballot for president of the ANC, Zwele Nkizi. Chow, chow, your money. But nonetheless, you can nominate a person from the floor with 25%. So there's going to be a ton of canvassing to try and get that support. But it's two weeks. It, this is, you know, there's 4,000... 4,300 delegates coming from across the country to coordinate that is not going to be easy. But someone will be nominated the new president of the ANC at uh, uh, the, the elective conference running from the 16th to the 20th of December. It might be Zwillian Kesey, it might not be. And then come January when parliament reconvenes, Ramaphosa will resign as president and we will get a new president of South Africa. It's a mess. But let's be very, very clear. The Paula Paula scandal is a mess. He phoned the president of Namibia and said, keep it on the hush hush. He had half a million dollars in his couch. Now, I thought he was going to try and kick this down and say, no, no, his farm manager's to blame. But this chappy who did the, the, the inquiry for parliament, who is an ex-judge and, you know, if anything was thought to perhaps be sympathetic to the president, they said, there's a case to answer here. You've got foreign currency. You've got to cash it into Tsar in 30 days. You can't vote a president of another country and say, keep this on the, on, on the lowdown. And as the, the judge who did the hearing said, half a million dollars, understand that the biggest denomination dollar bills, 100, is a lot of dollars to sit on the couch. Now, maybe he's got a lot of couches. <laughs> but if you read that report, and I scan read it this morning, the one point he says is, how do you not see half a million dollars sitting in your couch? So the president is gone. We will have a new one by Valentine's Day. Um, no idea who it will be. Current front runner is William Kesey. Yeah, enough about that. So the point is, where's South Africa? We've got 7.7 7 million unemployed people, which is just a staggering number. We're going to do sub 2% growth. We've got high interest rates, which will come down. We've got inflation, which is ticking down, but slowly. And then, of course, the elective conference. The markets today have hated the news of, of Paula Paula and the potential impeachment of the president. Let's also be very clear. The step aside rule is quite simple. Uh, the, the impeachment is not a criminal. He doesn't, what the ANC is talking in terms of step aside, he's not required to step aside. But he doesn't want this. He's a private person. He doesn't want his private affairs dragged in front of everything. And let's also be quite clear. How many times did the try and impeach uh, former President Zuma and fail? I mean, that's not his threat. His threat is that the Reserve Bank is investigating foreign currency exchange controls, regulations. Now, you don't go to jail for that. You just get a fine. I give the a buffalo or something, I suppose. But um, the short answer is, is this the end of the world for South Africa? No, let's be quite clear. So elective conference 2017, the top six were split 3-3 between the Ramaphosa and the REIT Brigade, Radical, Radical Economic Transformation, and the NEC was split, call it 52-48% broadly. At this point, as we stand here today, the, NEC, the top six is probably 5-1, to one, maybe you could even say it's 6-0 in Ramaphosa's side, and the NEC is probably 80-20 split. Um, in favor of, of Ramaphosa. Make no mistake, five years ago, uh, uh, the people who were running this country, not the politicians, the crooks, many of them are now sitting in jails in Dubai or in Johannesburg or in Cape Town. It's working very, very slowly, but we are in a fundamentally better place. I was at an event a few months ago and the speaker said, do you think we are in a better place? Raise your hand as a country. Raise your hand if you think we are. And I was the only person who raised my hand. I know it doesn't feel like it, but let's be quite clear. Five years ago, the Guptas were stealing, were plundering this country dry, and now they are in a Dubai jail. That on its own, to me, is why you raise your hand. Okay, I don't have power, so I can't see if anyone else raised their hand, but you kind of get the point on it. We will survive it. Markets will survive. Ultimately, markets don't care about politics. They care about profit. It is quite that simple. Of course, what, what, where politics can intersect is quite simply where they, where, you know, rules, regulation, and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, plunder, plunder.
So there is the top 40. Uh, this is a 12-month chart. We're up 7.8. That excludes dividend. Uh, there is there is indices. Uh, the Satrix Finney, the Resi, the 40, the Midcap, and then the Indy. The Indy is mostly NASPAS and Process, who had a brilliant November. So November was the best month for the JSC since March 2003. We had a storming up month. Two or three global markets. The Hong Kong index had its best uh, best month since 1998. Of course, it's like down 70%. So that's now it's only down 50%. Um, but we actually had largely a good year. And it doesn't feel like it, hey? We stand here on the 1st of December. And was it a good year for the market? Okay. I mean, if you own Facebook or something, then no. But locally, it was not a bad year. But it feels anything other than it. That's the USD index. This actually matters. This is the US dollar index. We're going back five years here. It goes back into the 70s. We don't need all of that massive trend in the in the dollar. That's why we saw euro at parity. That's why we saw, no, we saw the pound at parity because lettuce. Um, that was a massive move above standard deviation. It's coming back. We were not tracking this at all until the 26th of June. What happened on the 26th of June? Stage six. <laughs> and then suddenly we started tracking with the USD index. Hence, massive weakness. And that to me, in a, in a simple technical analysis, that's a reversal. We come back down to here. The dollars. Why was the dollar strength strong? Well, the world was scared. Why was the world scared? Well, the highest inflation in 40 years, war in Europe. I mean, can I, that, that, I can stop there, right? That's something to be scared about. So when you're scared, what do you do? Well, you move your money into dollars. Now your money is sitting in dollars, and heck, you can buy 10-year treasuries and earn 3.5% in US dollars, so people were. But now two things are happening. Inflation is coming down. The war in Europe is carrying on, but the world has moved on. And people are like, huh, so we're not all going to die a bloody death this year, maybe only next year. Let's do something with our dollars. The dollars are leaving the US and finding other places to go. Hence, and this chart is horribly out of date, uh, because I printed it at 10 o'clock this morning. Our RAND was weaker this year, but not by a heck of a lot. There's another issue there, of course, is that we sell lots of commodities. The world wants commodities. When you sell a commodity, you get dollars. What do you do with your dollars? You buy ZARs. And that's why we've been seeing massive RAND strength uh, until stage six, et cetera, et cetera. I expect that to continue. I think what we're seeing today, we're going to see some panic. Go have a look at what happened when uh, Klan Klan Nene got fired in 2015. There was huge panic. It lasted a few weeks. By the end of January, the world had moved on, including ourselves and including Des Van Royen, who didn't even make the weekend. Here are commodities. One year chart on commodities. The red one started iron ore, gold, 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 gold. I mean, I own, maybe that's the problem. For the first time in my life, I own gold. And maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I'm the bad news for gold. Rhodium makes sense. Rhodium was crazy. Wheat, that's nice to see so we can afford to eat. Aluminum and copper. Copper is the biggie here because this is obviously if you build something, you want copper. But look at coal. Uh, look at natural gas. Look at nickel. Uh, look at uh, gasoline, uh, which is down but was massively higher. Uh, Brenton, uh, West Texas, the PGMs. Commodities had an all right year. Now, what you notice with all of them is they all well off the highs from earlier in the year. Ignore nickel, that was a scam, uh, some, not a scam. They, they actually had to shut the exchange because nickel went crazy because uh, someone got caught in the wrong side of the trade. It's been a good year for commodities. The commodity story is quite simple. We, and when I say we, I mean the, the royal we, the 8 billion of us on planet Earth, haven't been building new commodities or new mines in over a decade. Because the last massive bull run and sort of leading up to 08, 07, 08, 09, everyone got their fingers very, very badly burnt. So what did they do? They just stopped building. We haven't had new capacity built almost anywhere. There has been a bit. There's been a copper mine in, down in Chile. There's been some iron ore uh, productions coming on stream. There's been practically nothing in the coal space, uh, almost nothing in the PGM space. Miners haven't been building. And the truth of the matter is, is that if you haven't built, it just gets harder and harder. So in Chile, in the olden days, 10 years ago, if you wanted to mine copper, the process took you about six months from application to approval, six months. Now it takes three years. And that's if the community doesn't object. Because in the olden days, if the community objected, they were quite simply told to stum, please go away. Now they suddenly realize, hmm, communities are perhaps important, like they live here, like they vote for us 
like they pay taxes. So suddenly a six-month process is a three-year process. And, and it, try building a coal mine. Not going to happen. Just not going to happen. Truthfully, coal is how we, this planet runs and will continue to run for a very long time. But in the meantime, uh, you just can't get new coal mines. Hence, Thungela. I've got to say, I, I bought Thungela at 30. I sold it at 90. I thought I was the smartest oak in the room. The thing wasn't even warming up. So commodities had a really good year. Uh, the same cannot be said for the S&P 500, although it is looking a lot better. A bear market, a real bear market, not the 2020 bear market, which if you blinked, you missed it because everything collapsed and then just went back to the moon again. This was a proper, proper bear market. Low grind, and then if you think everything's going to be okay, and then back down, and then it's all going to be okay, and well, here we sit, and who knows where it's going next. They did love what Jerome Powell said last night. I'll come to that. Um, and then the really, really ugly one, NASDAQ. Now this, I mean, I was alive in, in the dot-com. This is nothing compared to the dot-com. But I mean, you know, 35% down. And that's the average. Right? I mean, you know, Apple's down zero. Here are stocks in this index, NASDAQ 100, that would wish they were only 35% down. So we had a storm of a year compared to the rest of the year. The entire year, from the 2nd of January, our market has outperformed US markets in rands and in dollars. Man, that doesn't happen often. I, it, it's probably happened before. I can't remember when. Point is, the U.S. is not cheap. PE of 20.21 20. is not cheap whatsoever. And now you, there's the COVID crash. There's the um, uh, 0809 collapse. There's the dot com, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. U.S. market is not cheap. PE ratio, of course, is price and earnings. And what are earnings going to be next year? So currently for this quarter, earnings are expected to be minus two. Now that could be uh, uh, captains of industry sort of sandbagging the market, you know, saying it's going to be bad. So when they come in at only minus one, everyone thinks they're a genius. But the risk here is the E part of the PE. US markets are not cheap, and I don't necessarily think next year is going to be brilliant and fun and easy for them. Um, doesn't work on this side. Crypto. You know what? There have been two more bankruptcies this week, and I actually wrote that on Wednesday morning. So on Monday and Tuesday, there were two more crypto bankruptcies, and I think there might have been another one today. What's crypto? Is it going to save the world? No. Is it a currency? No. Is it a, a store of value? No. A hedge against inflation? Hell no. It is a risk asset. It's like trading a call option on the S&P 500. If you like risk, if you like stress and don't like your money, crypto is perfect for you. <laughs> or you could just send me the money. I'll sing soothing songs to you to alleviate your stress. If you have to have crypto, I think there are two rules. The first rule is don't leave it on exchange. Stick it in a hardware wallet. Because FTX, the second biggest exchange in the world, well, poof. Are the exchanges in South Africa safe? Sure, until they're not. A month ago, people told you FTX was, uh, with Binance, the safest place to have your crypto. Nonsense. If you want to hold crypto, put it in a hardware wallet. Buy the Nano Ledger Plus, S Plus. Cost you a grand or two on take a lot, take it off Ledger, and then make sure no one steals it. But they're less likely to break into your house than they are to break into an exchange. All do baskets. The problem is you can't take a basket off exchange because it's a basket, it's a, it's a product, you can't take it off exchange. But crypto and yeah, blockchain, ugh, blockchain is just a distributed database, man. I was doing those in the late 90s on dial up modem. Just never called it Bitcoin. The UK is a mess. In 2016, ahead of the Brexit vote, the UK economy was 90% the size of Germany, now it's 65 and falling. That gap is just getting bigger. It's just an absolute mess. Um, they're expecting the worst recession in 100 years. And when I say they, that is the Bank of England, says they expect the worst recession in 100 years. Inflation is still rising and might hit 15%. The Bank of England, in terms of rate increases, is way behind the curve. They're paying 4% for 30-year debt. The currency was momentarily on par with the, with, with, with the dollar for the first time since who knows when. There is nothing good to say about that unless you like, the, I was gonna say the queen. I rest my case, there's not even a queen anymore. Oh no. There's nothing good to say about the UK. China, 
world's second largest economy, Xi Jinping, elected for a third term. First person in China to have three terms because he had to change the constitution. I lie. <laughs> Chairman Mao had three terms. He had four terms. We know a lot about him and they weren't very pleasant. So China's in some sense quite easy. Read what they say. Go and read Xi Jinping's statement. Not in Chinese, of course, but in English. Because he, tell you, he tells you what he's going to do. And you know what? And he does it. He's not like all those other politicians out there who tell you what they're going to do and then don't do it because they're politicians. In China, they do it, in part because if they want to build a dam and there's people in the way, they move the people. And if the people complain, they put them in caps. I mean, it's not lacquer, don't get me wrong, but it's how they operate. It is a command economy and they command. Very important is that phrase, common prosperity, which still, again, at the latest uh, uh, conference, common prosperity came up. All that crackdown on the tech sector, all those crackdowns on education stocks, all of that was around common prosperity. That has not gone. China still wants common prosperity. And what that quite simply means, in a sense, is that we all do good and there's no trillionaires. Because no one needs trillionaires or billionaires or anything like that. Maybe a couple of millionaires, but the world does not need billionaires. I mean, look at the billionaires out there. I mean, line them up and like, no, we do. maybe Buffett. He's sweet. But then he's probably got a dark secret somewhere too. The common prosperity is now mostly in place. For example, Ant Group, who was going to list, was at the end of 2020, and what would have been the biggest IPO in history, and it got pulled just weeks before. They've paid about, I think, a four and a half billion dollar fine. And when you're paying the fine, that means that the whole investigation is kind of wrapped up, etc. So much of the common prosperity is there. For example, if you want to release a computer game in China, you need to get authority from the state. Up to November, they had released two. And they released 73 last week. So they can't, but what they not what what what's not going to happen is you're not going to go back to pre-common prosperity, because the Chinese government don't like that, don't want that, and won't have that. So it means that the go-go sort of pre, shall we say, pandemic tech in China, mm, it's just not going to happen. Those companies will still make money. Uh, Tencent is an absolute monster and a beast, and it will continue to make money, but it's not going to have that same freewheeling ability. And here's one thing, watch out for healthcare. There's going to be a crackdown on healthcare because that's the new thing. And when the crackdown happens in healthcare, Discovery is going to collapse like a house of cards because they have a 25% stake in a company called Ping An, which is a healthcare provider in China. Here's the truth of the matter is that this Ping An stake is worth one rand per Discovery share price. So when Discovery falls 30 rand in the crackdown, buy the heckness out of Discovery because the rest of the market will work this out and it'll recoup the 29 rand. But expect crackdown on it. US tech sanctions are ongoing. Trump started them, but Trump, the difference between Trump and Biden is that Trump did it on Twitter and Biden did it the old fashioned way. You know, put it, wrote it a letter, put it in an envelope, chained it to some oak's arm and he flew over to China. You know, the old way of doing it. He is cracking down on Chinese tech way more than Trump ever did, but he's being targeted. For example, the Uyghur Muslims, if you, if you produce goods in that region, you're not allowed to sell it into America. End of story. There are millions of solar panels currently held up in American ports that can't get out because they were built in the region and can't. They're targeting particular technologies. They're targeting three nanometer chips. They're targeting very, very precise. So that still continues. But there's a bigger issue in China, zero COVID. This, remember these heady days when China was doing 15,000? And we were like, yo. And then remember the heady days when we were doing 15,000? This is cases per day. There was a spike earlier this year, and now it's just going through the roof. This is up to and including yesterday's data. Um, the zero COVID was quite simple. One case of COVID lock the entire place down. The reason China has to do that is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there is no herd immunity because there just hasn't been enough infections. Secondly, the vaccine take-up has been very poor, particularly amongst the plus 50. And thirdly, their vaccine, Sinovac, is just not very good compared to the, the, the Moderna's and the Pfizer's and the Johnson and Johnson's. So they just don't have a population that can resist it. Now, the current variant Omicron is more, way less uh, 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 mortality, fatality than the previous, it's the deltas and the like. But modeling from World Health Organization, if this goes crazy, 700,000 Chinese die in the next five months, which if it had been under delta, the number would have been 5X and 
the thing is, Chinese hospitals can't cope. And what then starts to happen is you now need a knee surgery and you can't have it done because of hospitals overwhelmed. You need a, a, a heart surgery. You need cancer surgery. Remember all that stuff that the rest of the world was, was having last year and the year before? China hasn't had it yet. So the problem with this is that A, it's escaping, but B, if they continue with this lockdown plan, it really messes with the rest of the world because with respect, they're the second biggest economy. You kind of need them to come to the party, particularly for resources. But on the flip side is Xi Jinping can't just take his foot off the pedal and say, cool, let's just go crazy. We are starting to see a little bit of relaxing happening in some of the lockdowns in China. Uh, one of the regions where there's a Foxconn factory, they lifted some of the restrictions in the area. So they're toying with it because truthfully, you can't do zero COVID forever and you can't let it run wild. So he's got to get that balancing act. It's going to take time to get that balancing act. And in the meantime, China is going to be having way more COVID than ever before, while the rest of the world is looking ensconced and saying, dude, I thought we had moved on. But China hasn't. This is a problem. Uh, Rain, we're in our, for our third year of La Nina. We've never had three La Ninas in a row ever in the history of La Ninas, but hey, global warming, climate change, the world's a mess. Uh, lots of rain, good for farmers because they can plant loads of crops, uh, and because of uh, uh, wars in Europe and other places, they get good money for their crops, which means be long farmers, but don't be long consumers, uh, such as Astral or those sort of folks. An exception, I'll come to that in a moment. Infrastructure, yeah. Everyone promised that we were going to have lots of building post-pandemic because building is very, very good. It employs jobs. It's very useful. It's a great way to stimulate an economy, and there ain't no building happening. I don't know if you drove through Santon, Braston's gravel. Now, apparently, there's a reason for that, but I was in Kruger a couple of months ago. Man, and the roads in Kruger were better than Greyston. <laughs> the infrastructure is just not happening anywhere. Everyone promised it. The U.S., I mean, didn't the U.S. pass it? I don't know, was it a trillion dollars of infrastructure spend? Look at that order book that Marion Roberts has got in their little uh, American operations. It's exactly what it was last year and the year before and the year before that. It's just not happening. Politicians, lots of promise. No delivery, unless you're Chinese. Leisure, I like the sector. So October saw 566,000 tourists in South Africa compared to October the year before, 248. Now, of course, you're going to say, yeah, but Simon, I know, I know. Truthfully, that number is still tracking below 2019 numbers. But look what's happened in the tourist sector. It's got a lot more efficient. It's got rid of bad assets. Uh, City Lodge sold off the East Africa assets to pay down debt. Still a space I like a lot. The ZEDA listing, which is the most unfortunate name because we already have a ZEDA on the JSC. It's different spelling, but Zeta listing is that Zeta's on the 13th or is it on the 8th? There's two. It's one. It's the 13th, I think. Unbundling out of Barlow. Um, it's Avis and it's budget. It is unbundling at peak price. Don't touch it. At the moment, if you try and I used to go to Durban or Cape Town, and I would hire a car because it was cheaper than Uber, because I could get a car for two 250 rand. Now you can't get a car for under 800 or 1,000. But that'll change, right? Because they're going to restock their fleets. Prices are going to come down. Price wars will start again. It's a great asset, but it's going to be at a at peak earnings. And you don't want to be buying stuff at peak earnings. Logistics. So this is a picture from last year. This is uh, LA Beach Port, the busiest port in the world. There were 110 boats waiting to offload. That is the picture from yesterday. Supply chains are largely back to normal. It's been a long journey, but it's there, finally. It's also partly helped because demand is falling. <laughs> but hey, it, the reality is supply chains are looking better. Word of the year is going to be pivot. Are the central banks going to pivot? If you drink a shot every time someone says pivot, your 2023 will be epic. <laughs> Just say. And then everyone's asking me about Twitter and Musk. Here's the thing. Musk's problem with Twitter, apart from the 44 billion he burnt, but hey, you're a billionaire. His problem is not about tech. It's not about ego. It's not about Apple allowing his app on the phone or anything. His problem is political. European Union sent a letter to Twitter today, said, hey, hey, guys, remember that the only reason we let you exist is because of content moderation. And Twitter was like, sorry, who are you? Germany, if you say nice things about Nazis, you go to jail. He just let all the Nazis back on. His problem, it is not a tech or it is a political problem. Does Musk know that? I don't know. 
But that's where the game's going to be played. Twitter's going to survive. A couple of Fridays ago, everyone said Twitter was going to die. It will survive. We might get some fail whales. It could be messy. At times, it's a little bit buggy. But it, it's not, you know, everyone's rushed off to Mastodon and Hive and, and, and all those other things, et cetera, et cetera. Twitter ain't going anywhere. It's not making money. It's going to be messy. And Elon Musk is going to discover that when you buy something, you do due diligence. That's just 101 of buying, right? I mean, you would think. So those are the big pictures, and taking that, what are we looking at for <clears throat> next year, 2023? SA Inc. is cheap. Our forward PE is 9. 20-year average is 12. Our market remains cheap. Dividend yield of 3.5. Resources have got, I'm going to come to financials. Resources have got potential, even if prices just broadly stay where they are. But there's risk. And what is that risk? China. If China absolutely has a disaster 2023, and they are the big consumers of commodities by and large, then commodities are going to have a tougher time with it. At the wind of the back of the resource space is, as I said earlier, just a lack of new capacity has come on stream. And if you now suddenly decide that we need more copper or nickel or whatever it might be, it is a three to five year journey, if not 10 years, if you're doing green fields. It's not going to solve itself in a heck of a hurry. So I still like the commodity space. I still have some exposure in the commodity space. China's the risk. My sense of China is that they're going to very much bump it along. And by this time next year, they'll probably be past, mostly past the zero COVID policies, but it's going to be a painful process to get there. And let's be very clear. The protesters that we see in China there was a whole lot of theory over the week, of, during the week, that the protesters would overthrow the state. No, not a chance. China is 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years old. You don't overthrow the state. Tiananmen Square. China will take whatever it takes. When uh, Mikhail Gorbachev basically took down the, the Berlin Wall, and his first engagement post that was with the Chinese Premier, and now I can't remember his name at the time. He actually just passed away earlier this week. Um, and the Chinese premier said to him, what are you stupid? Mikhail Gorbachev was, there's nothing I could do. And the oak says, no, you are stupid. China, they will keep their state going. And understand how, it, it, you know, China's fascinating. Um, they've been in the wilderness for 150 years. For China, that's but a mere blip. The Opium Wars in 1850, where the English basically forced the Chinese to give up Hong Kong. And the Chinese said, okay, we'll give you Hong Kong but you must give it back to us in 150 years' time. And the English were like, yeah, sure. And 150 years later, China came and said, <clears throat> we'd like Hong Kong, please. China's not playing the short game. They're not even playing the medium game. They, they think in, 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 in centuries, in millennia. And they will protect their state at whatever the cost is. Uh, banks... So yesterday, I loved banks. This morning, or this evening, they were about 7% lower, which means I love them 7% more, right? So here's the thing. Banks hate a weak rand. Banks hate political uncertainty. My sense is they'll get over it. We'll have a new president sometime during January. It's going to be tumultuous. It's going to be scary. It's going to be worrisome. We have no idea who it will be. But the, the markets will survive that. Look at the banks post Nene. It was a tough couple of months, and then they were actually a really, really good buy. I still like banks. I still think they're offering opportunity. They're not expensive. They've had a great year, but they're still not expensive. They're offering chunky dividend yields. And when I say I love them 7% more today, yes, it's tongue-in-cheek, but truthfully, today was a massive sell-off, and this afternoon, I bought some more Satrix Finney. Because I like the Satrix Finney, and it's like the same price it was, well, actually, truthfully, early November, because we had an astounding month, but nonetheless, I think there's opportunity there. Uh, industrials, your defensives, healthcare, healthcare is cheap. I don't like healthcare because I worry about legislative risk. And what I mean by that is that healthcare should be a human right. If you go back to the ARVs, when uh, it was costing 15,000 Rand for a person to have ARV treatment in a month, and Brazil, India, and South Africa went to the manufacturers and said, you can't do that. And the manufacturers said, hey, hey, of course we can. And they said, well, then we're just going to rip it off. And we're going to tell the world that either we rip it off or people die. It's your PR nightmare. 
So what do we pay now for monthly treatment of ARVs? Buck 35. And the manufacturer still makes money. Yeah, I know. I don't like the regulatory risk. The biggest two places that inflation have happened in the last 20 years has been education and healthcare. Governments are coming. The world over, governments are coming for healthcare. Uh, British American tobacco. Yeah, look, you know, if you've got an issue with, 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 with buying death sticks, then fair enough. But if you haven't, this pays a nice sterling yield four times a year. Uh, they're new generation products, they call it non-combustibles, whatever's. Um, it is cigarettes. I'm a smoker. Buy yourself some. Tiger Brands. So I, I hold some Tiger Brands, and Tiger Brands is quite interesting because there's been a, quite a technical breakout on it as well. They've got input inflation. They have perhaps the third worst management team in the history of management teams. Um, and I say third because that's so you can all wonder who's first and second. I don't know. Pick your worst. Um, I think someone's going to buy them. I don't know who, but I think of the buyout targets, I think Tiger Brands might be one of them. NASPAS process, all about China. I quite like Bidcorp. I've been, oops, sorry. I've been digging through Bidcorp a little bit lately. They got some fat, they got some chunky margins. So they basically, around, they came out of Bidvest, right? They supply the hospitality industry the world over, uh, all over, literally the world over. And they, they I was worried about input uh, 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 inflation. But man, they passed that on and some more. In a rising inflation environment, they grew margins, which is just shake your head. And if you think that hotels and bars and events like this evening are all opening up again and things are starting to happen, Bidcorp is interesting. Absolutely. It's not exciting. It's never sexy. It's not going to pay for your next Ferrari. But uh, so, as I said, financial store, best sector, uh, Finney is a nice and easy, ABSA is probably the best of the bunch in terms of valuations and momentum, and coronation, if you want a little bit of risk, but you get a nice bit of yield, of course, that yield will drop because there's two periods and the next one will drop out, et cetera, et cetera, um, but it is solidly cheap at this point in time. They, of course, need some decent markets so they can make some money. They've been suffering from outflows and lower markets and all of the rest. But at, in the 30 bucks, I think they're quite attractive. They don't like weak czar and they don't like political worries. But, but the, certainly the political worries, I think, will pass in time and I'll come back to czar in a moment. Uh, my click is worrying me. There we go. Resource stocks. Resource stocks is China risk. That to me is the big question. There are production lackings. PGMs as vehicle sales pick up again now that we've got the supply chains working. Of course, who's buying those vehicles in a recessionary environment? Truthfully, a lot of people, the uh, car fleet companies who don't have enough vehicles to rent out to prospective clients, uh, the people who couldn't buy a car for two years during the pandemic. Here's my most favorite stat. April 2020, South Africa is in lockdown. I'm going to studio, but I have a letter that lets me out of the house. You remember that time? We sold 60 vehicles. Who are the 60 people who went out in lockdown, got a letter and bought a car? Who drive where? You couldn't go anywhere. Uh, I and all, I don't know. I think the party's over. I mean, the party's not over. $800 is a great price, and folks like Afrimat and Kumba and BHP make a truckload of money at that point. But the 200 plus prices just make no sense to me whatsoever. Oil, so we've got an OPEC plus meeting on Sunday. It's virtual. They never make big decisions at virtual meetings, which means they'll stick to their schedule. I think their schedule is a cut in production of about 400,000 400, barrels a day. There is talk of a million. I don't think so. And then on Monday, the European Union is supposed to finalize details of putting a price cap on Russian oil. But those talks started when oil was 120, now it's 85. I mean, where's that price cap? They were probably thinking, I know, we'll be nasty. We'll make it 95. Well, now you've got to make it 60. Uh, who knows what's going to happen there? The thing with oil is a couple of points. We're getting massive supply into the market because America is releasing a million barrels a day. Uh, Saudi Arabia is pumping like no tomorrow, but Iran is not pumping anywhere near capacity. Nigeria can't and isn't pumping anywhere near capacity. Um, and of course, demand is weakening because, well, hello, recession and high petrol price and no money and everyone's poor and all of that sort of thing. Um, the oil's probably of the commodity space, to my mind, the big scratchhead. You can almost make an argument either way for oil. And I'm going on the bear case. I don't think it's going to collapse. I think OPEC wants it around 80. It's probably going to stay more or less around there. Um, but I don't think you know, it's all going back to 130. Apparently not. Because you know what? I said a moment. Ago, here's a good. Here's the thing. So I was saying a moment ago that markets don't care about politics and politicians and stuff like that, right? So Russia invades Ukraine. 
everyone agrees. Well, okay. Most people agree that that's a bad thing. Our government doesn't. But aside from that, most people agree that that's a bad thing. But what was people doing? They were buying Russian oil. How do we know that? Well, A, we could we see what the ruble was doing. Traders don't care. Investors don't care. If there's money to be made, they will make it. And Russian oil perhaps proves it better than anything. Uh, coal has probably peaked, but <laughs> profits remain absolutely insanely massive simply because you know that there is there are currently 95 coal-fired power stations in construction on planet earth we are not we we will at some point perhaps in the way distant future get rid of coal not this year not this decade not by 2050 not in some of our lifetimes the coal demand is still there it absolutely is uh Cetrix resi which i currently hold uh so i also hold sabanya and if you want some gold exposure pan african sabanya i like a little bit of gold in there uh and then of course mostly pgms and mostly palladium as opposed to some platinum from local but then palladium coming out of uh, still water. They've had some serious problems with flooding with strikes with all the disasters etc uh but those sort of things are we touch wood one-offs um, and they're going big into into lithium and the like but that is a much longer term picture in that sense there gold we have inflation highest in 40 years and gold is bumbling along like it doesn't know what's happening on a tuesday evening i hold gold for the first time in my life well actually i've been holding it now for a little while um and it has been a monster disappointment so far uh, i should have actually bought a kruger and because at least they're pretty i could look at it um so if you look at gold and inflation gold does usually respond a little bit late and let's be clear about the inflation the best thing to beat inflation is inflation right because you get the base effect and then unless the price doubles again you know like you think of petrol yes petrol went up 50 percent but it needs to go up another 50 percent for it to have the same impact in inflation the easy win in inflation is is, is happening Particularly in, in the US, we've seen the numbers coming down. We've got that lovely number for October, which everyone loved. Our local inflation was not lovely, 7.6, it was slightly upper, but the easy win has happened. The hard part with inflation is not the turn, it's getting back to the bottom. In the case of the US and Europe, 2%. That is not, we will be back in our target range by the middle of next year. We'll be back at four and a half by late, by the end of next year. Our big inflation is fuel, uh, and administrated prices, ESCOM, water, rates, things that are not, that, that interest rates have absolutely no control over. So I hold some gold because maybe at some point it'll make me some money. But truthfully, the only way I've ever made money on gold before was shorting gold miners and maybe I should just stick to what my netting was. Retail, yeah, retail is, is struggling, but we've got some great retailers. ShopRite, always, always, always ShopRite. Pepco, it's kind of like the ShopRite for clothing, or those numbers were like Mr. Price. I mean, they just missed. Lewis is one of those weird ones, which I always just kind of disregard them, and then they kind of plod along and do all right. But I've got to say, their, 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 their 12 month returns have not been spectacular this year at all. Um, you know, people have to eat, people have to clothe. And what I like about the shop rights and the pep calls is that when we're rich and we're all shopping up at Woolies, well, there's other people who are coming into the process. And when we're tough and we can't afford Woolies, well, we're all shopping down. So they kind of get wins both ways. And what they get more than anything is customer loyalty. And pep call has got like the biggest telco in the country. And they're not a telco, but they sell. I mean, you speak to, 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 to someone in taxi and they've got a cell phone. Where did they get it? They got it at a pep. Just everyone got to the pep. Uh, property still tough. This is the castle back to work barometer out of the US that crashed because of course Thanksgiving, but it has not got above 50% at all since the pandemic started. That is office occupancies in 10 major cities in the US. People are not going back to the office. I know one of the companies I worked for decided that everyone must come back to the office full-time effective one January and staff basically just said no. And they said, but we're the boss and they said, okay no <laughs> and the boss is like but you have to you know stamp feet people aren't going back to the office ah, day or two a week you we suddenly worked out we can work from home or the beach or madagascar or whatever and you know what we're productive it's just managers who want to fiddle so property yes no but there is our second tier properties Bukele, uh, Octodec, uh, Spear, uh, 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 Elemental, uh, Elementary, Element, ele something. 
They're trading at 30, 40, 50 percent discount to NAV. They're offering you 10 plus percent yields. There are risks in those. Of course, they are. But you get a little basket of a couple of those. You've got some great assets at brilliant prices. When I was learning about markets back in the 80s and the like in the 90s, the rule of property was quite simple. You don't buy unless you have discount to NAV. And then for a decade, we threw that out the window and we would buy a property stock at 150 percent of NAV. And what happened? Well, you got ripped because you got ripped. When you go house shopping on a Sunday, you don't look at a house and say, I like it, but I want to pay more, please. No, you negotiate down. So there's some really good property there. I still, I'm lazy here. I like CS prop. I'm going to buy some, some, some second tiers. I'll come to which ones I'm looking at in a moment. Leisure. Now, look, I'm on holiday in 14 days. So for me, leisure is the best thing in the whole wide world. 14 sleeps and I'm on holiday and I absolutely, it is, this has been, it's been a hard year, and I tell you what, November was like the longest month in the history of months. I don't know why, but November wouldn't die. And then when it did die, what did it birth? Parla Parla. Um, so I like City Lodge and Sun International, but you can make an argument for pretty much any of the direct hospitality stocks on the JSC. Cash, so retail savings bonds, so the rate came down today, you get 10.5% in a fixed year, uh, 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 retail savings bond. Is your money safe? Yes, because the government owns the printing press so they can always pay you back. Um, the thing with this is don't look at your portfolio and think, yo, it's been horrible, let me buy cash. But if you, you know, if you have a need or you have a want where you want some cash in a portfolio, this is about the best thing you, you can get. 10.5% guaranteed locked in. And if the rate goes up, you reset and you get the new rate. You reset term and rate, but you get the new rate again as well. And after what happened Today, we might get a nice rate for January. We might not. A lot of people waited. It was 11.5% as of yesterday. A lot of people waited for today, and it came down by a percent. If you like 10.5%, take it. There is, of course, tax implications on interest. Interest rates are rising. Inflation is coming down, but it's going to take a while. The U.S. is probably going to peak around 5, 5.5%. Five Jerome Powell last night said that they will go slightly easier. Uh, Gary Boyson was here a moment ago, and he was. that was his hope that we would get a, a so instead of doing 75 points in, in, in December increase, he's saying maybe we'll only do 50. The point is that the terminal rate, the ultimate target, remains the same, about 5 to 5.5% five in the U.S. In South Africa, two more increases to 11, maybe 11 and a half. I got to say, I thought that we would pause at uh, uh, 11, but if you listen to the governor's speech of last week, not a chance. He's going to come back in January and March. Hopefully, he does a quarter percent at each, which takes us to 11. He might do half a percent. The thing is, is that, as I said, the inflation drivers in South Africa are nothing to do with demand. We have no demand. Um, it's, it's administrated prices. It's imported prices. But if you let... Uh, 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 the U.S. interest rates run away, uh, then what? You know, but the, the, the gap, people just start rushing money out of South Africa into the U.S. and our rand collapses. And then, of course, our rand collapses, so the imported inflation goes even crazy, and it just becomes a horror circle. It's coming down. It's going to be slowly. Uh, yeah, the U.S., the U.K. just stuffed. Interest rates are falling in time. I think the U.S. will start maybe mid-2024. What you notice with the Federal Reserve is they have been very, very uh, uh, set on our target is 2%. Not close to 2% or nearly 2% or, or kind of 2%. Their target is 2%. And that's what central bankers need to do. They, lot, they lost a lot of credibility when they panicked back in 2014, when they started to raise rates. There was a, a taper tantrum in the markets and they quickly reversed their decision. Um, and you need central bankers who stick to their story, whether you like the story or not. And I think certainly uh, the BOE, uh, ECB, uh, Fed Reserve, they're going to stick to their mandate. We're not going to see rates come down in the rest of the world anytime soon. I had thought we might get a rate cut late next year, but I think that's possibly off the table, maybe, maybe only Q1 2024. So higher rates for longer. Uh, US tech got smashed. It's not over because of the earnings. I think we're going to likely see a recession. Truthfully, in my mind, we have a recession in the US. They did two negative quarters of GDP growth. I know that they've got the National Bureau for something and something that must officially declare a re 
Sure, 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 sure. But I'm old school. Two negative quarters of GDP growth, bang, your recession. The U.S. is in recession. Um, I think markets can be green in the U.S. I'm not so, the, the 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 Nasdaq, yeah, S and P, sure. But I don't expect it. I mean, if it can do more than double digit, I will be I will be blown away. This is not a are going to be a massively bullish U.S. at all, and that's simply because earnings. And I still think value over growth, boring over tech. Tech is a long way from coming back. Part of the thing with tech is you can build stuff when money is free. Money is not free anymore, and it's going to be some time before it is free. Suddenly, those VC oaks are like, yeah, but are you planning on making a profit? Oaks are like profit? <laughs> be silly. <laughs> yeah, for the, for the laws. Uh, European Union, the war in Ukraine is not going away, but the world has moved on. Here's a fun fact. North and South Korea are still at war. They have an armistice. There's not going to be peace. Is Ukraine going to say to Putin, sure, have part of our country, let's be friends? No. Is Putin going to say, oops, my bad, I'll go home and everything's fine? No. So what's going to happen? Nothing. The war will continue and the world has moved on. We're buying Russian oil. We've sanctioned their oligarchs. We've taken their boats and all of that sort of thing. And the war starts to become a non-event. There are two issues. One is wheat, and that is starting to come out of Odessa to a degree. Um, and the other is oil, but we're buying Russian oil anyway, so what's the worry? I mean, it's, it's, it's truly horror if you're Ukrainian, because the world is just like, sorry. Um, energy crisis. So this winter will be fine. Two reasons. It looks like it's going to be a relatively mild winter, and they got their gas storage tanks up to stack. But if they want to truly make themselves independent of, of Russian energy, and that's gas more than anything else, it's going to be a challenge. But again, let's focus on valuations and let's ignore the politicians. Lots of Europe is nice and cheap, and lots of Europe are really some good companies sitting in that space there. Eurostox 50, some great businesses in there, global companies that make good money. I remember one of the best things I ever bought was Greek bottling. So remember the Greek crisis when Greece was going to default and Europe was going to explode and the world was going to end? That was 2011. It happens all the time, but any, it, and it didn't happen. But everyone looked at the bottling plant in Greece and sold it. But here's the fun fact. Yes, they were a bottling plant in Greece. They bottled Coca-Cola, but they didn't do any sales in Greece. 100% of their production was exported into the rest of Europe. And that shared one point was trading at 20% of NAV. I bought it on a PE of 1.1. My first dividend I got from it was 3x what I paid for the share. Uh, so some stocks for 2023 because I'm hitting my time. So now we get to the fun part. Remember what Paul said, hey? Nothing here is real. Unless you make money, in which case it is. ShopRite and Pepco. ShopRite is just an – you should always just own ShopRite. It, 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 when it gets cheap, when it sells off just from a buy it, their check is 60-60. It's not the best in South Africa. It is. It's the best globally. A um, friend of my sister's lives in Boston, and he uses Amazon Fresh. And then he's in Durban with my sister, and he's taking the 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 the, the show, and he's like, "Yo, check how this thing works." So like Amazon Fresh, you got to like book a delivery slot of like over a three-hour window. And I mean, my check is sixty sixty. I think my record is twenty-one minutes. I can't do it that quick. Anyway, the only problem is six, and I've learned it, hey. So there's some things you don't know size. So you think you're buying this little chocolate arrives like you're big you're like, "Yo, no man, I need a," you know, or you bought something and you didn't realize there was six of them, and like you get but I'm learning. I'm slow, but I learn. Um, Patrick's Finney, and if you want individuals, Absa, and if you want some spice, Coronation. Coronation is not going to be a, a simple journey, but they do pay you a good dividend yield to hold them. Sun International is my preferred in the space. Yeah, I also hold City Lodge. Soho is fine. Uh, Sun International, Sun Hotels, whatever they call themselves, they're all going to be in the same place. Oddly enough, gaming is kind of survives tough times. The people who go gambling sort of don't or stop gambling just because they haven't got money, turns out they stop eating. <laughs> now, like, that's like for real. Uh, 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 Robert Mabella on my show this morning, he sent me the data, like, oh, the oats are like, yeah, anyway. Uh, property, I like Fukili, I like Octodec, I hold the CS prop. Um, 
there's a bunch of these that you can hold in there. There's spear as well. Uh, there's bunches. Just go look at those second tiers. Don't go look at the third tiers. Hey, don't go buy deltas and ribosis. And like some of them are bankrupt. Leave the bankrupt ones to go bankrupt. But some of these are trading, it, and then some of them are going to have tough times. But you buy a nice little basket, you're in biz, things will be fine. I like the Eurostox 50. There's that ETF. Uh, Tiger Brands take over Target. Highly speculative. It is currently, as I said, it broke out. I think was the level one, 182 or 178. Or, I forget. There was a technical level on the weekly chart which it broke. It was very, very nice. Now it's running. I think someone's going to look at it and say, you know what? My kid can manage that better. Let me buy it. Someone should phone Elon Musk. Uh, top 40, I think we're going to be green next year. And I gave that lots of thought before this morning, and I gave it lots of thought post this morning. I think there's enough wind at our back. I think commodities will be okay. Uh, not great, but okay. And maybe they will be great, but probably just okay. I think our banks are going to be fine. Uh, we've got really high quality companies. A lot of the struggles that we have, 7.7 .7 million unemployed people, 2% growth, uh, high interest rates, these are not new. Understand and if you run a company in South Africa, and whether it be a one-person man or woman shop or whether it be a shop right with 150,000 staff, it is always tough running a company in South Africa. It's just that the tough is in different places. You know, one day it's this, one day it's other. No one in South Africa runs a company because it's easy. It is hard being a boss in this country. So you're used to hard times. And a new president, yeah, what the heck? Um, I think the rand can go stronger, particularly seen as we now are at 1780. So it just made when I was saying that yesterday, we were at 1680, and I'm like, mm, but now we're why is our rand going to go stronger? Well, initially it's not going to go stronger, but I think two things are in its favour. One is I think dollar strength is largely over, uh, and two, I think what we're going to see with the currencies again, those commodities, those are going to help hold it up. How much stronger? I'm way too smart to say how much stronger. But I think we can be better than 17, 18 next year. I'll be brave. We'll be better than 17 next year. And let's be clear, the RAN can surprise. We could be forked. I mean, this RAN could go to 12. I'm not saying it will, but we've been there before. Uh, December 2001, 21st of December, the RAN hit 1361. I remember that because my wife and I were living in KZN. We rushed down to Incredible Connection and stuff, uh, uh, and we bought white appliances because if you thought the RAN was going to 100 to the dollar, and we better buy white appliances now. It was 14 years before the RAN got back to 1361, and en route, it went to 5 RAN 75. And yes, we had a massive commodity boom at that time. We don't have the massive commodity boom, but we certainly have the commodities. So Africa has the world's commodities. If you were playing a, a risk game, one of those sort of civilizations or something, and you were given South Africa as your country, you would win every time. Because what's the only thing we don't have? Oil. And it turns out we do have oil. We just haven't found it yet. We have the world's commodities. All of them. We're not going to see rate cuts in South Africa next year. Uh, who's our president next December? I have no idea. It will not be President Ramaphosa. It will be somebody else. It also won't be in Kosovo and Glimini Zuma. There's a bullet we dodged. Um, now I'm a smoker. Me and her did not see eye to eye. Uh, I think the U.S. can do green, but I would not get massively excited about this, and I don't think there's going to be a ton load of money to be made in the U.S. Dividends are going to be under pressure. Share buybacks are fading away because they've got no cash and earnings are at risk. And what I'm ex truthfully expecting, I think the bottom is probably in, and that might be famous last words. In markets, but I think they're going to just muddle along. And if there's a risk to US equity markets, I think it's to the downside. Uh, US, EU, UK, recessions, recessions, recessions. I mean, pick your economy. China, no recession but they've got other issues. Uh, US inflation, not back at target, nor EU, nor UK, and therefore no rate cuts in any of those. Uh, US value beats growth. There are, uh, and my metric for that, there is a US value ETF and a US growth ETF. Um, and all of this year, the value has been consistently outperforming and just continues to do so. And I think it will continue. Value is like consumer staples, right? Toothpaste. Times are tough, but we still brush our teeth. You're supposed to say yes. <laughs> and that's what value is. Boring stuff. Railways, utilities, things that like are there and are like cheap and like paid dividends and don't 
live on your smartphone. In fact, that's a good thing. If you can get it on your smartphone, it's not value. Uh, I think Europe is the better developed market that we're seeing right now. And I think China GDP is going to be below 5%. I actually think it might be below 4%. In fact, probably it will. The thing with Chinese GDP, I mean, 4%, yo, lovely, world's second biggest economy. Except it's usually done six or seven. And I know we say the numbers are fake, but as long as the numbers are always the same fake, we can use them as a benchmark, right? Um, I, and that's a problem for the world, and it's a problem for commodities. They're not going to go into recession. They're too big an economy. They can juice it. They've been printing cash and putting money back into the banking system again. Um, their property sector is a real problem. Uh, people buy apartments, and the, people, and the, 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 the builders take the money and build other, you know, other apartments. Uh, there was a podcast I listened to. guy bought his apartment 12 years ago. doesn't have it yet. hasn't yet been built. Um, but people the world over measure, you know, owning property. I mean, it's a weird thing, but people love to own property, particularly the one they live in. And China's no different. And their property sector is a mess. But again, they will manage a controlled collapse. This is what China does. Don't, 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 don't bet against the Chinese. The, if you're playing poker and a Chinaman walk comes in, leave. Like you're going to lose. Just like leave. Like I don't know. I don't know how they're going to win, but just leave. Uh, and then the Russia-Ukraine war carries on. And that's just the sad part of it. But the Russia-Ukraine war goes on. The world moves on. Uh, Putin doesn't get what he wants. Ukraine doesn't get what he wants. In fact, Putin gets a lot of what he doesn't want. He's strengthening NATO. NATO is expanding, et cetera, et cetera. The war will drag for a long, long time. There will, at some point, I suppose, be some sort of armistice. But just recently, remember they had a, uh, elections or, or, or uh, whatever it was in four of the regions. I mean, they weren't free, they weren't fair, they weren't anything. And everyone voted to have Russia controlled. No surprise, because they were held by Russia. Russia's already withdrawn from one of those four regions around Donbass. I mean, the war is going about as bad as you can expect. ETFs. Keep your long ATS, max out to a tax free, just carry on buying. I do monthly debits and they just fire off every single month. In fact, it would have fired off today. Um, so I really got shafted because the US bounced yesterday and the RAND crashed, so I paid more for it. Uh, but I just bang off and I buy myself ETFs every single month. My portfolio is now about 56% ETFs. My medium term target is to get that to around 75. I'm getting old, I'm getting lazy. And I love ETFs. Who doesn't love an ETF? Um, and then it's 2023. Um, I'll end with a few quick words. I've slightly run my time, so I'll keep this short. It's been a tough year. It's not going to be any less tough next year. But that, remember that as a country, particularly South Africa, we survive in spite of. I mean, we were reminded in the past few weeks of the assassination of Chris Harney on April 1993. Um, if you Think back to Sora Maposa and, and his negotiations with uh, um, uh, Rulof, what was the chap's name, Rulof Mayer. Um, if you think back to Sora Maposa in the 80s when he ran circles around the big mining companies as a, as a national union of mine workers. Um, this is a country that's never had it plain sailing, ever in its history. But here we are. Uh, it works. We somehow manage to muddle along. And day to day, it never feels like it. And when you look forward, it never feels like it. But when you look back, we live a pretty good life. And somehow we kind of make it work in spite of it all. Definitely in spite of our politicians. We'll leave it there. Ladies and gents on the webcast, thank you. Ladies and gents who came into Santon, awesome seeing human beings again. Thank you, everyone for your time. There is snacks out there and there was a rumor that there might even be bubbles out there. So run fast because like we need bubbles. Uh, contacts and then of course what Paul said, hey? <laughs> you make money, it's yours. You lose money, no longer yours. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for the traffic. <laughs>